Okay, so um, the first question, so I'm Alex, and uh, the first thing is if you guys have any questions, just shout it out. I have this light in my eye, so I can't really see like beyond the first row here. So just shout out a question if you have any questions. I like to keep my talks really informal. Um, so I'm the editor of RealClearScience.com, so I just was hired by this, uh, by this uh, website. And um, so I'm kind of a science communication person. I'm someone who likes to engage the public and bring more science to the general public and so we can increase science education in, this, in the country. And so we've already been asked, well, why, why are you qualified to talk about genetic modification? You're a microbiologist. Well, microbiology does deal with a lot of genetics. In fact, I've modified probably 100 strains of bacteria, not of cats or dogs or plants, but of bacteria. Um, and uh, I'm not going to talk about my research because, frankly, no one's going to care. <laughs> so I got my PhD, got out of there, and got into an editing job. And so I'm, uh, <laughs> I don't know if from UW is listening tonight. <laughs> anyway, uh, so I thought I'd uh, start with that. That's my background. And so as a, as a bit of an icebreaker, OK, how do, we get, how do we get rid of that thing? OK. Um, is there any way we can get rid of that box so it doesn't appear? Oh, okay. Well, I guess we're going to leave it up then. Um, so how many of you are familiar with genetic modification at all? Like, and how many of you think it's okay? Just keep your hands up. Okay, how many of you think it's not okay? Okay, and, and how many of you are mis you know, just kind of in the middle, don't really know? Okay, great. So we got about a mixed audience. That's Perfect. So we're going to start with a little bit of an icebreaker. We don't have to, you don't have to like trade shoes or anything like that, so we're not going to do that kind of icebreaker. But find the genetically modified organisms. So upper left corner, was, that, was Frankenstein genetically modified? Yeah. No, just an assemblage of dead body parts, not genetically modified. <laughs> Glowing green rabbit, genetically modified or not? <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, her name is Alba, by the way. Um, tobacco plant, uh, glowing tobacco plant. Genetically modified, yes. What's the benefit of that? Cigarettes that light themselves, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. Uh, bottom left hand corner, watermelons that are square, genetically modified. Yeah. No, very good. Just put them in boxes and then they grow like that. They don't roll around your refrigerator. <laughs> genetically modified corn, yes or no? Yeah. Trick question, yes. They don't look like that, <laughs> but yes. And then the last one here is from the island of Dr. Moreau. Also a trick question. The thing on the left looks genetically modified. Jury's still out on Mar Marlon Brando. Not sure. <laughs> not sure. Maybe, maybe not. OK, so a very brief history of genetic modification. Um, GM Foods have been on the market for about 17 years. So they're not a, a new thing. They've been around for almost two decades now. The first was something called the Flavor Saver Tomato, which um, apparently didn't save a lot of flavor because it went out, of, it went out of, off the market in about three or four years just for lack of demand. No one really wanted it. Um, not, not because they were, I think, scared of the tomato, but there were some other competitors on the market, and they just, they just didn't do well. Monsanto bought them and shut it down. So, but since then, genetic modification has really kind of taken off in the country. Um, most, a, a lot of agriculture is genetically modified in this country. You'd never know it because you, there, there's labeling is not required on food. So if you go to the market and you buy something, it doesn't have to say this product contains genetic modified organisms. It doesn't have to say that. I think it does in Europe, but it doesn't here. Um, soybeans are, are, are very common. Obviously, soy milk is common in Seattle. Um, most soybeans, so this is a, a chart that I've, I put together. I got this uh, from Wikipedia, uh, which actually, believe it or not, is an extremely good source. It's, um, Nature did a study on Wikipedia, and they found that it was just as accurate as Encyclopedia Britannica. Um, so anyway, soybeans, they put in herbicide resistance. So wh wh what's the point of herbicide resistance? I'll talk about that in a second. Um, but about 93% of soybeans in this country are genetically modified. Corn, 86%. Cotton seed oil, cotton, 93%. Hawaiian papaya, 80%. Canola oil, 93%. Sugar beets, 95%. So we're talking a substantial portion of our food is already genetically modified. You just don't know it. Um, so Safeway, um, I just kind of picked on them. But if you go to a GM, uh, to, a, to a grocery store, most likely about 75% of what you'll pick out of the grocery store contains at least one genetically modified ingredient. You're probably eating it right now. I mean, sorry, but you are. Um, it's everywhere you go. Um, so it's like I said, it's estimated that about 75% of processed food contains genetically modified ingredients. 
how do you genetically modify something? So there's, in general, there's three steps. I've done this. Uh, like I said, not with animals, but with bacteria. Step one, identify a gene you like. Step number two, clone the gene. We're going to talk about that in a second. Not that kind of cloning, not Dolly. Um, and then you insert the gene into an unsuspecting animal or plant. Um, in, in my case, uh, I did bacteria, unsuspecting bacteria. So what kind of cloning, then, if we're not talking about the Dolly the sheep type of cloning, what are we talking about? OK, so on the left here is, uh, <laughs> aw, that's uh, a copycat, and is the first cloned cat. Yes, I didn't name it. I didn't name it. Um, that's the kind of cloning where they take uh, a nucleus out of like, a, like, like a, a, a body cell, and they transplant that into an egg cell, and then they can stimulate the egg to grow into a full organism. That's the kind of cloning that made copycat. That's the kind of cloning that made Dolly the sheep. Um, that's not the kind of cloning we're talking about with genetic modification. The type of cloning we're talking about is the other cloning. You don't need to know the details, but, but the point here is you have one piece of DNA represented by that red circle, another piece of DNA represented the blue line. You cut out the piece of DNA you like, you put it into the red circle, and then you put it into a plant or an animal. And then you cross your fingers and hope it works. That's basically what they do. Yeah, 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 yeah. So th that's actually the term. You might have heard transgenic animal or transgenic plant. It means the gene came from another animal. It's very common to take bacterial genes. Bacteria have a lot of really interesting properties. And so they'll take genes right out of bacteria and then put them into a plant. That's, uh, that's not how they made the glowing bunny. But the, but the bunny rabbit that glows green, that came from a natural gene found in jellyfish. So there's a jellyfish that float around that glow green. They thought, oh, wow, what a cool thing, right? Let's put that to a rabbit and see what happens. And it worked. I mean, it, it doesn't hurt the rabbit. It's not radioactive or anything. It just glows. And so, um, so yeah, so that's, that's what's meant by transgenics. You'll probably hear that term, transgenic organism. It means the gene was taken from another organism. So how, in the case of like herbicide resistance, how do they do that? What's the use of that? Why would you want that? OK. So, I'll tell, you the, I'll tell you the punchline first. The reason you want it is because spraying a whole field with herbicide is, you know, not great for the environment. And besides, if you spray herbicide, you can kill plants that you don't want to kill. You want to keep your crops. You don't want to kill the, the, the crops. So what, what scientists have devised is a way to put a gene which confers resistance to herbicides into crops. Then you can spray the whole field with, with the herbicide, and it only kills the weeds and not the crop. Okay? Same thing, same idea went into insect resistance. Can you then use uh, less herbicide in order to? Uh, you know, I don't know. I don't know about that. Uh, for, insect, for insecticide, which is, er, see, herbicides aren't necessarily terrible, terrible for the environment. Insecticides are. Uh, insecticides also kill, if they kill bugs, they can kill us, OK? So uh, I'll get into that in a second. So the reason toxins, putting in insect-specific toxins, is better for, uh, for, for agriculture is that you don't have to spray insecticides, because insecticides are really, really toxic for the environment. But I'll get, I'll get to that in a second. So the way they found herbicide resistance is they took bacteria. You can grow trillions of them at one time. You randomly mutate the bacteria. You, so you can add a chemical which causes the bacteria to freak out and the DNA just goes nuts. And, and the hope is, is that at least one of those bacteria among trillions will mutate a gene that will automatically confer resistance. So it's kind of an artificial selection that you're placing in the, on the population. What then happens is, is then they take this poison called glyphosate, which is what's used in Roundup. Say, if you've heard of Roundup, that's, that's the, the herbicide that's used. They plate the bacteria on this poison, uh, glyphosate, and one or two of the colonies will grow. Well, those are the resistant ones, OK? So you take those. They know which gene confers the resistance. They cut the gene out of that bacteria and place it into the plant. And voila, you've got plants that grow in the presence of herbicide. And so your flowers here, the plants we like, are happy, and they don't mind the weed killer, and all the weeds around them are killed. And this is, the, like I said, this is a, a chemical called glyphosate. That's what the, that's what the, uh, 
the weed killer is made of. And the reason this works is because this particular metabolic pathway only exists in bacteria and in plants. It doesn't exist in people. So you can spray to your heart's content while on the field. It's not going to hurt us. I mean, you may not want to spray so much because you don't want to kill everything out there. <laughs> but the idea that it can hurt us, it doesn't work. We don't have the same metabolic pathways that plants do. So you could, you could technically drink some glyphosate and you'd be fine. I wouldn't recommend it just in case, you know. But, but technically, it doesn't have this, we don't have the same metabolic pathway, so that's why this works. I insect resistance is the other, uh, the other thing that I wanted to, to talk about is as a very common example. A lot of our genetically modified crop, crops have um, this toxin called Bt. Bt stands for Bacillus thuringiensis. It comes from a bacteria which lives in the soil and it produces a toxin that is specific to insects. So if an insect eats this toxin, it dies. We eat the toxin, our body just processes it like any other protein and doesn't do anything to us. So it's an insect-specific toxin. You can take this gene, which is in bacteria, and then you can genetically engineer it. You can also genetically engineer it to crank out a lot of this toxin, too. And that's, that's one of the common modifications is to take the gene, which produces a poison, and then put it, manipulate the DNA in a way that, that actually just makes more and more and more. It becomes a protein, a, a toxin factory, essentially. And you can clone this into whatever gene, whatever plant you like that you don't want eaten by bugs. And this, this modification alone has reduced the use of insecticide in this country alone by 450,000 kilograms for cotton alone, okay? So we're talking a massive reduction in the amount of insecticide that's needed. And like I said, of all the chemicals we can go out there and spray, insecticide, DDT, okay, really, really nasty stuff for the environment. This is a really good invention, in my opinion. Does it impact the flavor at all, like the foods? Well, according to Flavor Saver, <laughs> uh, you know, I, th that's, a, that's a more complicated issue because sometimes uh, during the agricultural process of breeding the best kinds of plants, and this doesn't even involve genetic modification, okay, just during the agricultural process of breeding certain kinds of plants, flavor can actually be kind of knocked out. There was a common complaint that strawberries don't taste like they used to. You know, people say, you know, they don't make stuff like they used to. Strawberries, it's actually true. Strawberries, a lot of flavor has been lost from the best and the hybridization of strawberries. So, I mean, I don't know if that would necessarily happen with genetic modification, but that does happen in agriculture. Sure. Okay, so there's some really incredibly useful and cool genetically modified crops. Uh, wheat is, is uh, I, don't, I, I don't know if wheat and rice are actually on the market yet, but they are, I know for certain, in production. Uh, there's a strain of wheat that's drought resistant, so if you're worried about global warming, worried about places that actually just have droughts naturally, Australia, Middle East comes to mind, um, these will survive effects of climate change. This wheat will grow whether it rains or not, essentially. There is a rice that has been modified to contain beta carotene, which is a vitamin A precursor. So places that grow a lot of rice but don't have a lot of other food, at least they can get their vitamin A. Vitamin A deficiency kills about one to two million people every year in the world. And of the people who aren't killed, 500,000 go blind. So it's a very nasty problem, in particular in Southeast Asia. And so this is a way to help them at least meet their basic nutritional requirements, just like adding iodine to salt pre prevented iodine deficiency disorder, which is a big goiters that you'll see on people from in the uh, developing world. People who have big goiters, usually it's from deficiencies in iodine. Uh, bananas are also have been uh, uh, genetically modified to re be uh, re resistant to bacterial wilt. This is a very important crop in Uganda, Central Africa. Um, in fact, the the I'm not sure which tribe it is, but but the word for banana in one of the tribe dialects is actually synonymous for food. So that's that it's so important to their culture that it is basically their word for food is, is what they call banana. So it's very important for the people of Africa and for the agriculture in Africa to have a, a, a crop that's not destroyed by this wilt bacteria. Uh, there's potatoes, which have been engineered to have more protein. There's trees, actually, that have been, um, that they're thinking about engineering trees that are better at sequestering carbon dioxide as a way of fighting global warming. So you could plant a whole forest of trees which capture the carbon and take it down to their roots, and then the carbon won't come back out into the atmosphere. Um, 
And then there's another one here. Arabidopsis is, a, is the general model used in plant genetics. And they have, they have created a new plant that uh, will detect explosives. And the leaves will actually change colors in the presence of explosives or pollutants. Um, it doesn't happen like that. It's not really fast. It takes like hours. So, you know, <laughs> it'd be nice if one day if you walk into the airport and it's just, just like a whole forest <laughs> that turns red. If you know, <laughs> that's not what we have yet. So, uh, but maybe someday. Uh, so going back to that, the importance of genetic modification in Africa, you can see that genetic modifi ge genetically modified crops are being grown all over the continent. Right now it's mostly in the trial phase, so uh, the squares mean that the crop is actually being grown commercially and the circles are just testing. Most of the crops are just being tested right now, but there are a few places, South Africa and Egypt, where they're actually growing genetically modified crops for commercial purposes. The reason that I think genetically modified crops are so important, uh, and I will talk about problems at, towards the end of the talk, but the reason I think they're so important is that the, the, the population of the planet is expected to be 9 billion, that's another 2 billion, in the next 40 years. We have a lot, that's a lot of hungry people to feed. And there are food shortages throughout the world, there's nutrition shortages throughout the world. We have to address that. Genetic modification isn't the cure-all. It's not going to fix everything. But it's one viable tool in the tool belt of solving world hunger. Uh, second thing is you've got, we have to find a way to increase agricultural yield. Um, we've got certain countries, India and China, that are growing and growing and growing and growing. But the land isn't growing. There's only a limited amount of land. And so we have to be more efficient at producing crops than we currently are. And the third good reason is to reduce the use of harmful insecticides which are demonstrably poisonous for the environment. And then the fourth, of course, is that um, global warming concerns, crops can help take care of, at least help combat global warming or combat the effects of global warming. OK, I'm going to pause just for a second. And is there any, are there any questions? Am I being unclear? Yeah. Um, why Africa in the? Or was that just an example? Th that's just an example. Okay. Um, one of the concerns with Africa, the, the question is why Africa? Why are, they growing some, why are they growing genetically modified crops there? Well, hunger is still a very big problem in Africa. And so they're interested in getting this kind of technology going to help feed people. Okay. Yeah. Any, anyone else? Yep, yep, yep. Why, why would we want to just grow so, so much food instead of working on population growth? Instead of working on population growth? Well, I think that's probably easier said than done. Um, you know, China has, has implemented a, I believe, I don't know if they still have the one child policy there or not. I know they tried that for a while. It, I mean, there's still 1.3 billion people there, even with that policy in place. Um, I think it's easier said than done. People, populations grow. Especially in the developing world, you know, they have a lot more children in the developing world than we do in the developed world. In Europe and here, it's like, what, two children per family? In the developing world, it's much higher than that. So we have to feed them. Yeah. Yeah. What's the difference between, like, back in the day, farmers splicing plants together and genetic modification? So, so the question is, what's the difference between, like, just traditional hybrid plant genetics and what we're doing now? The, the problem with traditional hybrid plant genetics is, one, if you have an organism, has, have a trait from another organism that's not a plant, how do you get it into the plant? Um, I mean, the, the bizarre example was, well, if you want your plant to grow glow green, there's no plants that grow <laughs> glow green naturally, so you have to get it from another organism. But things for like um, glyphosate resistance, they got that out of a bacteria. So there would be no, there'd be no biological way to cross a bacteria in a plant. You have to do that through genetic modification. The other thing is that when you cross plants, you're not in control anymore. Nature takes charge. That'd be like saying, let's cross two people and hope something you know, great comes out. Okay? Well, you're not really in charge of what genes get mixed together. In this case, they can specifically take one gene and say, we want this gene in this plant. That's, so it's a very highly specific process. Except are you, you're not guaranteed that if you took this gene and had that expression in that organism, that it's going to have the same expression in that plant. Right, and so that's, that's part of what geneticists, so the question was how do you know that you're going to get the same expression from the original organism into the, the new organism? And that is one of the, the primary concerns. Um, they, have to, they have to manipulate what's called a promoter sequence, which, which activates gene expression, and they also sometimes actually have to modify maybe even the DNA sequence itself 
itself to make the expression of that gene um, good for that particular organism. Well, yeah. yeah. I mean, because that gene could actually be shutting off other genes in the plant or turning on genes that you don't sure. want. Sure. Sure. And that's, that's all going to be tested through the, through the process. We'll have a, a, a long session for questions at the end, so okay. let's, um, let's move on with more. Yeah, okay. please, thanks. Okay. <coughs> okay, so what about genetically modified animals? And they want to be left out, so these are glowfish, by the way. They glow. I, I have a, an unhealthy obsession with glowing animals, I think. Um, so, anyway. Some of the, what I think are very, very useful genetically modified animals. Mosquitoes. Uh, there have actually, if you've been following some of the science news lately, there have been some trials, unbeknownst to some people, they were kind of surprised and they found out that genetically modified mosquitoes were released into some, some countries. What they're doing is they're testing to see whether or not these mosquitoes, which are genetically programmed so their offspring die, are able to bring down mosquito populations. The reason that's important is because mosquitoes spread malaria. They spread dengue fever. Dengue kills about 20,000 people a year, and malaria is awful. I mean, it infects, I think, on the order of like 200, 250 million people a year. It kills a million of them, mostly children. And it's just a really nasty illness. And so the idea is if you take these mosquitoes that are genetically modified to not, uh, to, to, to basically they're sterile, essentially, because their, their children die immediately. So what the hope is that they'll reduce the number of mosquitoes, thus reducing malaria and dengue fever. That's in trials right now. Uh, there's a new chicken that won't spread the flu. Um, it can come down with flu itself, but it can't spread the flu once it gets it. And it has to do with a modification that disables the virus from replicating. Once, it's, once it gets inside the chicken, the virus can no longer replicate. So the, vi so the chicken can get sick, but it won't spread the illness to other chickens. <laughs> Then, of course, there was a whole controversy about salmon a few months ago, about salmon that can go bigger and faster. And the idea here was the sustainability, because we like fish. In fact, if you read the BBC today, uh, global fish demand is the highest now than it's ever been. Fish throughout the, throughout the wild populations are being fished out of existence, essentially. So we have to find a way. People like to eat fish, so we have to find a way to have uh, fish that's sustainable for a population that wants it. And uh, this is, of course, was, it's planned to be grown. They're not going to be released into the wild. It's planned that they're going to stay in fish tanks or whatever. And then there's uh, pigs, which are environmentally friendly. This may not sound important, but they're, uh, they make environmentally friendly manure that uh, lacks phosphorus because uh, phosphorus and nitrogen, going back to biology 101, eutrophication, which is the process of destroying a lake, um, what happens is if, if too much uh, of their manure gets washed into a pond or to a lake, the nutrients in it will trigger algal blooms, which will then cause the lake to, s to slowly die. And all the fish will, will, will uh, there won't be enough oxygen for everything and the, the lake will slowly die. So they have, it's called Enviro Pig. And it's, uh, it's, so it's an, it's an environmentally friendly pig, basically. I, I, I I have some reservations about this, but my, so I, I know a molecular biologist back at Southern Illinois University, and one of the questions is, well, why would you want to do some genetic modifications to things like mice? What are you doing? A lot of the genetic modifications are man, meant to, one, facilitate research, and the second one is to just see what happens. And that kind of sounds mean, but how else do you find out about genetic disorders? Um, they, they would use strains of mice called mutator mice, which were hyper mutable. And so they would, they would just mutate very quickly. And they can then trace where the mutation is. And they'll say, oh, well, this mouse here grows you know, um, extra hair and also a longer package. Um, <laughs> it does. And they say, well, this gene is responsible for this external feature of the animal. They also did things with, uh, they found a mouse that can run almost two kilometers before it gets tired, and they called it Marathon Mouse. Uh, Mighty Mouse has colossal muscle development. Fierce Mouse is abnormally angry, and um, <laughs> Smart Mouse is, um, has improved learning and memory. The reason this is important is that you can, once you identify the genes that are involved in all of these 
phenotypes, which is the, the characteristic you're interested in, you can then find a homologous gene in people. And so you can say, oh, this gene's involved in muscle development. It's also similar to this gene in people. That's the gene that we should be looking at in people to see whether or not uh, we want to follow up with this particular disease. That's the point of genetic modification for lab animals, OK? You get weird stuff, and then it gets reported in the news. Okay, <laughs> so and then the one here in the bottom here, he sings uh, like a bird. This was one of the uh, mutator strains that random mutagenesis in the mouse produced a mouse that could chirp like a bird, and I mean not necessarily useful, but just interesting. So, GMO safety. Um, are GMOs going to kill us all? Um, hope hope not. Probably not. But here's an example of the controversy. How many of you here have heard of RBST free milk? Yeah, everybody, right? It's, it's big here in Seattle. Um, it's a growth hormone. So this is not technically genetic modification in the sense that we've been talking about. Uh, this is actually just taking a, a hormone and injecting it directly into a cow. It's not genetic modification, but it's kind of lumped into the same category. Proponents of RBST say that, well, look, it's a hormone. It doesn't cause a cow to grow bigger, but it causes it to produce more milk. Um, also, if you're uh, concerned about the amount of methane produced by cows, and it's a lot, they, uh, mostly from belching because they eat a lot of grass. The, the archaea that live in their stomach produce methane. They're methanogens. They belch out a lot of methane. It actually has an impact on global warming. Um, if you want to reduce that, you just inject them with this, this hormone that produce more milk. Uh, besides, there's no such thing as hormone-free. Anything you eat has hormones in it. Plants have hormones. Animals have hormones. Everything has hormones in it. And of course, it's cheaper. That's what the proponents say. The opponents say that it causes cancer. Uh, that's misleading. Um, the reason the opponents are saying that is because it's been shown that the, a level of a hormone called IGF-1, insulin-like growth factor 1, increases in milk that it has RBST injected into the cow. And that particular hormone is associated with cancer in people. Now, they're making the leap that, therefore, if you drink a lot of milk, you'll get cancer. That's not scientifically proven. And you, you can't say something like that in science without proof that that link exists. And there is no proof that that link exists. Um, if you want to oppose RBST, do it on grounds that it's bad for the cow, because it is. Um, cows that are injected with hormones get udder infections, so the mastitis, and they also uh, have a problem with walking. Uh, not all of them, but some of them do. And so it, it's, it, there might be some ethical considerations on, well, do we want the cows to be comfortable? And if your answer is yes, then RBST is probably not the way, probably not the way to go. So if it isn't that great for the cow, then how do we know the genetic modification or RBST or any of this stuff is OK for people? OK. So there is safety testing that goes into, into genetic modification. Um, it's based on a principle called substantial equivalence. Believe it or not, most of the food that's on the market really hasn't gone through rigorous testing in the traditional sense you know, of, of doing like clinical trials, where you feed people you know, Cheerios, and then you don't feed other people Cheerios and see what happens to them. We, food doesn't do that. We don't go through that kind of testing. So they, they base the safety on the idea that, well, we've been eating corn for, since time immemorial. Therefore, corn is presumably safe. If you take a genetically modified version of corn, how does that compare to the original plant? That's the question. If the question is they are substantially equivalent, then it's deemed safe for human consumption and passed on to the public. If the answer is no, they're not substantially equivalent, then you go through several rounds of testing, including gene transfer, allergenicity uh, uh, problems. They have detected food that is allergenic. Um, bioavailability, toxicity. They do all sorts of a whole gamut of tests to show that the genetically modified food actually is safe. Then it's released to the public. Now, you know, they're never going to do the clinical trials where you have, you know, a group of people who are fed genetically modified tomatoes every day for a year and a group that's not, they're not going to do that. It's not practical. You can't do it. Um, but this, is, this has been the standard, not developed just by the United States, but by the OECD, by the World Health Organization. This is the international standard for genetic modification testing. 
if you still are distrustful of GMOs, um, that you think maybe they're linked to cancer, I would, I would present the following statistic, which is that for the past 10 years or so, cancer rates have been going down in the United States. So despite the fact that genetic modification has been increasing, most of our food, 75%, of it has genetic modified ingredients in it. Cancer has been going down in the United States. It's partially because we stopped smoking as much as we used to. But cancer rates are going down and life expectancy is going up. That in itself doesn't prove anything, but it does take away a little bit of the firepower from the argument that genetic modification is unhealthy because this would seem to contradict that idea. Again, it's not a slam dunk, but it's fairly decent evidence. It's called an ecological study. It's, it's decent evidence. What are the legitimate concerns about GMOs? There are legitimate concerns. That, that, you know, don't get me wrong. I'm a scientist. I love modification. I love innovation. There are legitimate concerns. One of the legitimate concerns is allergenicity. What happens if you take a protein from a peanut and put it into something else and it kills somebody? Okay? Could that happen? The answer? Yes, it could happen. So they test for that. An example was the Brazil nut. The Brazil nut creates this protein which is very allergenic. They didn't know it at the time. They took it and they put it into a soybean and then they tested volunteers. And they found that it caused an allergenic response in people who were allergic to Brazil nuts. So they said, scrap that, don't do that, don't kill anybody. It never, it never even made it to market, okay? So they do test for this kind of thing. Um, there's a question about harm to ecosystem. If you put a toxin into the environment like, be like BT toxin, which targets insects, could you maybe kill off monarch butterflies, something you don't want to kill off? The answer is maybe. I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, one of the examples was a monarch butterfly, and they said this was killing monarch butterflies. I'll talk about that in a second. Gene transfer is the other problem is if you put herbicide resistance into a plant, and you don't, you know, you want to spray Roundup on a field. Well, how do you know that that gene resistance isn't going to spread to your weeds? And how you not, how you know that you're not going to make um, super weeds? And that's actually a problem. Agriculturists refer to them as super weeds. Um, those are the three legitimate, very legitimate concerns, and there are three legitimate answers to those concerns. Sure. Sure. I don't know what's called this termination gene. Basically, Monsanto was selling plants that could not reproduce, and therefore farmers were forced to purchase more seed from Monsanto rather than, and, and, and that then also spreading to neighboring crops, that gene being transferred. And I yeah. mean, that's. Yeah, we'll talk about that in a second. So um, we'll talk about that in a second. Yeah. So the question had to do with uh, terminator sequences which produce sterile seeds. What if that spreads into the environment? We'll talk about, we'll talk about that. Uh, are, you, are you good to go? OK. So the responses to the concerns, thank you that we're going to talk about that. Uh, allergenicity is tested for. So they, they will not put out a food that hasn't been tested for allergies. They don't want to get sued, OK? Because trust me, if someone gets sick from these foods, they will get sued. They don't want that. Harm to the ecosystem is actually a legitimate concern. We don't really know. There is, I, to my knowledge, there aren't a ton of long-term studies. What we do know is that they've been grown for 17 years. We haven't seen a lot of noticeable bad changes to the environment when it comes to this kind of thing. One positive is, actually I read this article a month or two ago, it was, it was a, a, something called a halo effect. So, so let's say that you have a toxin in your corn and your neighbor grows organic corn, okay? He says, well, I don't want the toxin in my corn. The conventional farmer with the toxin in his corn will produce a halo effect and it kills all the insects in the area. And the organic farmers would actually benefit from the conventional grown corn because they, he wiped out all the bugs in the area and they would benefit from it. So, you know, is it possible that there are long-term effects? Yes. It's been, we've been going in for 17 years, haven't noticed a lot of problems. The, the solution, in my opinion, is to keep doing it, but monitor it closely. Watch it for the next 20 years. Make sure that, that nothing happens. And if something does happen, pull it from the market. Okay? We can do that. We have done that. The story with monarch butterflies is common. It was debunked a couple of years later. Uh, the, the, the original study which showed that toxins were killing monarch butterflies was done in the lab. And they pretty much gave the monarch butterflies not a lot of choice in the matter of whether or not what pollen they ate. And of course, they ate it and died. Uh, in the field, the monarch butterflies tend to stay away from the genetically modified 
uh, pollen. I don't know how they know, but they know. And they tend to shy away from it. They don't really like a lot of the pollen anyway. They, they tend to go to the, the milkweed plants that don't have a lot of pollen on them anyway. So in the field, that's where the real science has to occur. Lab gives you theoretical stuff. The field is where the real testing has to occur, because that's where you really know what happens. The gene transfer thing, which you had brought up, um, one of the solutions is, well, if we don't want genes to spread to the environment, create pollen-free plants, plants that don't have any pollen, or plants that, don't, that, that make sterile seeds. Now, your question is, well, what if the terminator sequence gets out into the natural environment? Well, they'll die. The plants die. And so for, from an evolutionary point of view, it won't spread beyond death. <laughs> and so it, it, it's kind of a self-correcting problem. Yes, it might occur, but it will kill whatever progeny come from that. Um, the, the, the counter argument is, well, Monsanto's being greedy. Um, they're forcing poor farmers to buy plants over and over and over and over and over again from them. I'm not a business ethicist. That's a business ethics problem. I would be sympathetic to that argument, but science solves the problem. Science says, if you don't want the gene to spread, make pollen-free plants. If that causes an ethics problem with Monsanto, that's a business ethics problem. And so I would be sympathetic to that, but it's not really science anymore. So kind of summing it all up, in my opinion, the pros outweigh the cons. Uh, the pros are that we could potentially save millions of lives with genetically modified organisms, not just with food, but with uh, reducing chemicals in the environment, which are toxic to people as well, insecticides, fighting disease, uh, the mosquitoes. That is just I, I, the idea of malaria going away would be just such a triumph of, of modern medicine on the scale of getting rid of smallpox. Okay, smallpox we got rid of through vaccinations. Malaria that may not work. Um, and they get, they, it's proven that these, not proven, but the, the evidence, the, the balance of the evidence seems to indicate that GM foods are safe. Um, again, I am perfectly willing to, uh, to, to support the idea of doing further long-term studies. Of course, that should, you should never not monitor things in the environment. And then uh, the cons, you know, what's the long-term environmental impact? It is uncertain, so we should monitor it. And then, of course, the uh, unethical business practices is something that is a legitimate concern, but it's outside the realm of science. So in my opinion, the balance favors the known benefits over the hypothetical costs. If you want more, so I actually ran this talk by one of my former professors, and these are his two books down here. He said this was his favorite slide. So if, if, you, like, if you like this kind of stuff, uh, Nature and New Scientists have a lot of this material. Wikipedia is real, a really good source on this as well. Uh, Molecular Biology Made Simple and Fun um, with the monkey on the cover uh, is a great source. Biotechnology Applying the Genetic Revolution is another great source. Full disclosure, I'm going to be writing a textbook with him uh, called Microbiology Made Simple and Fun. And it is simple and fun. And, um, but, or better yet, Go to realclearscience.com, my website. Uh, we have a topic index. I mean, besides daily news, we have a topic index. Ge I've got a whole bunch of stuff on genetically modified organisms, all the latest news we compile and archive on our site. And that's it. Question time. So we're. Um Thank you for that. We're, we're actually going to take a short break, and in the interest of having a lot of time for questions, I think we'll meet back here in five minutes at 8.30 and have half an hour for questions. Um, during the break, I encourage you to start filling out the evaluation sheets that are on the table and that really help us report back to the, our, our funding agency, the Institute of Museum and Library Services, um, about how these events are going. Please do also the Q include the Q&A session for that. We also have a raffle up front. Uh, for a couple of passes to the Science Center and to IMAX movies. Um, this is a great time for you to go put your name into the raffle box. We'll see you back here with your questions ready to go in five minutes. Thanks. Um, it's, so the question was, uh, ha has there been any research into creating genes from scratch? Yes, sort of. Um, it's extremely difficult to do. Uh, there was, a, I, I believe the bacterium was mycoplasma. Uh, J. Craig Ventner has created synthetic organisms. And by synthetic, what they mean was they found, they sequenced the original organism, and then they just duplicated the sequence 
outside, you know, in a machine, and then they put it into a bacteria and it worked. Is that synthetic? Well, <laughs> yes and no. Um, it, it, I, there has been some idea of just creating some new genes. They've tried that, and they just kind of do some random stuff, and they pull out genes and they see what works. It's in its, it's in its infancy. It's certainly not really any, in any position to help out genetic modification at this point. We have a question from the back room. Is organic food genetically modified? In this country, no. I, I believe that the rule is if you call yourself organic, it cannot have genetic modi genetically modified foods in it. It can use pesticides, and they can use insecticides. They tend to use different, a little more eco-friendly ones than the conventional farmers will, but um, they cannot have genetic modification, genetically modified ingredients. It seems as if genetic modified foods is controversial in some quarters. I understand in EU, for example, they don't allow them. What basis, what scientific basis did they cite to ban genetic modified foods? A lot of the things that I have already addressed, the common concerns, are often the concerns that are cited by people who are opposed to it. Um, they'll say things like, we don't know if it's safe for human consumption, but that's not completely true because we've had them for 17 years and there haven't been any noticeable problems with, with people. There are also an extensive review process that we went through, this is the uh, substantial equivalence uh, thing, which shows that as, as long as you can prove that a genetically modified food is similar to a conventional food, that you know it's considered safe for human consumption. Um, the environmental studies are also something they cite. We don't know what the long-term ecological effects are. Um, that's a common complaint. There are two foods that I believe are allowed in the, the EU that are genetically modified. One's a potato, and I don't know what the other one is, but there's only two that I know of. Yeah. Uh, I think. We have a question all the way in the back. Okay. This is sort of a two-parter. So could you ever geno genetically modify an organism so that its flesh didn't decay? Um, I'm sorry, I didn't hear the first question. Could you ever modi genetically modify an organism so that its flesh didn't decay, like with plant life or... So it won't decay? Yeah. Okay. And wouldn't this herald a zombie apocalypse, let's say? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I've never been too concerned about a zombie apocalypse. Um, it, th th there was a, the flavor saver tomato actually was genetically modified to not rot that quickly. That's, that's why it went to market. That's why it saved the flavor, was that it, pro it prolonged the, the, the health, the, the shelf life of the tomato. Um, they knocked out an enzyme that was part of the degradation process. So yes, that can be done. Will you ever make a rot-free food? Well, uh, <laughs> hamburgers, like, Happy Meals, you know. <laughs> um, I, you, you know, I, no, that, that, you'll never have a rot free fruit. That, that probably won't happen through genetic modification. And then the zombie thing, I, no, probably not. I'm not concerned about it. Um, with the modification of the, um, the mosquitoes, how does that affect other organisms in that ecosystem who depend on the mosquitoes for survival? Right. That's and once they are released and they cause all this damage, there's yeah. no way to take that back. Right. That's a question of bioethics, essentially. The question, the question is, is what will happen, because if you put a mosquito into the environment and it decimates the food web, okay, and you have, you know, the frogs can't eat the mosquitoes and then the snakes can't eat the frogs and then Armageddon basically occurs, okay? That's a possibility. It ain't, I, of course, it's a possibility. What you have to weigh is that possibility with the fact that one or two million people might be dying per year, okay, from malaria alone, okay? The question is, do you want, you know, is it worth the risk? And that's a question for bioethicists. It's a question for, are we willing to watch people die when we might be able to do something, but doing something might not be the best for the environment? That's not a question I can answer. It's a question for bioethicists and, and courts. You, you say it's a matter of ethics in some other, like it's a business ethics, ethics question or something like that, but as, you know, a, 
as a proponent for this technology and the development of it, don't you feel responsible for if it does create these negative consequences? It's not just a matter of, oh, it's someone else's problem to worry about. It's you as the scientist for developing and spreading that. Well, I mean, I, I, I don't develop it. I'm, I'm, no, I'm not being I'm not saying Santa. you, but, <laughs> uh, but just uh, When it comes to saving human life or destroying the environment, I pick saving human life. And that's why, that's why I support, not, not, not just me, but the World Health Organization supports the limited application of DDT, okay? Uh, it's not me. The World Health Organization supports this. The UN supports this. Is DDT great for the environment? No. It's not. But they think that if it comes to the, the, the effects of biomagnification versus, you know, so harming animals versus saving people's lives, the UN and the World Health Organization has come down on that issue. And they favor doing what they can to save people and trying to limit the harm to the environment. But, you know, that's, so that's the kind of issue that you have to deal with. Um, there are unknowns. There are dangers to the technology. That's one of them. Well, I'm sorry, I just have to uh, respectfully uh, elaborate on what you just said. If it's a matter of saving humans versus the big picture of the environment, it's the environment that ultimately saves humans. So I think it's important to keep that in mind. Um, I guess my bottom line is, what if I don't want it? And Right now, there's no labeling. There's nothing indicating. When I saw your list of what it what already it's uh, contained in so many other foods, I'm I'm a little miffed uh, that I wasn't aware of those things. It should be my choice what I'm putting in my body. Okay. Um, contact your congressman. You know, th this is something that's going to have to go through Congress. Um, the FDA, I'm not sure if they have the right to just say, okay, this is the way it is. I don't know if legislation has to be passed. If that's something that upsets you, then contact your congressman. Con contact uh, the senators here in Washington, in Washington State. Yeah, it's a big issue right now yeah. on, uh, in Washington. You know, I, I mean, I'm not going to disagree with you that, hey, we have ingredients in here, we don't know what they are. Like, uh, yeah, I mean, that's a reasonable argument. But it's, that's not, sci scientists aren't responsible for that. That's the FDA and Congress. Yeah. Uh, with regard to, say, chronic human disease, can you speak a little bit to the, the current state of, like, human gene therapies at all? It wasn't as hopeful as they had wanted it to be. So when, we, when the Human Genome Project was announced, we thought once we sequence the whole DNA of the human genome, essentially all chronic conditions are going to disappear. And that, well, really didn't pan out. Uh, it's tough to do. Um, I, I can speak to how they do certain technologies. For instance, people who have, um, oh, I can't think of it, um, a certain lung disease. Um, cystic fibrosis, thank you. There is a way to uh, treat cystic fibrosis by putting, so adenovirus is one of the viruses that causes the common cold. And they can alter the, the DNA of the adenovirus so that it doesn't cause infections, doesn't cause you to get sick. And they can put in the, the normal, healthy copy of the cystic fibrosis gene. And then you can inhale it just like you would you know, an asthma inhaler. Uh, it has limited success. Um, if there would be more success, you'd be hearing more about it. The reason you're not hearing a lot about it is that it's, it's just hasn't been as successful as scientists hoped that it would be. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Hi. Uh, I, uh, was, I have actually a kind of a controversial question for you. Um, so the potatoes that were filled with protein, uh, so I'm just wondering, is the, did the guy who ha went on the potato diet cheat? <laughs> That's a question for bioethicists to consider, I believe. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I don't know, for sure. But for sure. <laughs> Hi. So um, I, I'm going to try to make this rapid. Uh, I have a lot of things I want to say, but I'm going to try to make it quick. Um, uh, I'll just start by saying that I've done a little bit of research on uh, effects of BT genetically modified corn on monarch butterflies. And um, I will just say that stepping outside of that, and as my personal opinion, I'm worried about this being in the hands of large corporations that are not worried about 
uh, they're not as concerned as they might be about safety, in so, uh, unless it affects their bottom line or, or you know, uh, lawsuits against them or whatever. So that's, that's kind of my personal side. Uh, on the scientific side, I'll say that, um, and, and, and you know this as a, as a person who's done experiments on genetically modified organisms, that, that my big concern when I heard about genetically modified corn was that they wanted to kill insects that were feeding on the corn kernels, but the protein was being produced in pollen and being spread outside. So as a biologist, I, I used to study uh, genetically modified flies. If you did those kind of experiments where you screwed up and put your protein outside of the uh, interested part of the organism, then you wouldn't be able to publish. But when you're Monsanto, you can spread it to 90% of the corn plants in the world. And so, so just to cut really, really short, because the other comment I was going to make is, that, is I think that you actually have it wrong about it being debunked. Um, it is true that the corn experiments were not done in a field trial, but the field trials actually showed harm as well, ultimately. And it was, a, it was an ecological model that they used to, to essentially, they say, that it's not going to have effect over a long term because of when the pollen is being produced relative to when the butterfly is there. So it's more complicated than just saying that it was debunked. But leaving that aside, I just want to ask you a, a, a simple question, which is, don't you think that the, that they should be responsible for just producing a good plant, one that only produces the genetic modification in the organs of interest and doesn't produce it in places like pollen that could potentially affect. Okay, so, so there's a couple of things. Uh, the monarch butterfly thing, they showed, they showed that toxicity occurred if there was 100 pollen grains per square centimeter of plant. The amount of pollen that was being spread into the environment was far less than 100 pollen grains per square centimeter of plant once you got about six meters outside of the uh, planted area. So the field trial did not match what the laboratory trial should said. They were completely different. So I disagree with that. Um, the field trial showed very different results than the lab trial did. Um, in regard to create, what was the last question about creating a it was, it was basically um, making, a, making a plant that yeah. would produce the toxin only in the organ of interest and right. not in organs like the pollen producing organs that are irrelevant for the, you know, the... Well, the plant geneticists yeah. are very, very aware, aware of that. I mean, you can control where and what organs and what tissues these, gene these genes are expressed by picking the, the proper promoter sequence. The promoter is the, the thing which drives expression of the gene. And there are some promoters that are turned on in the fruit. There are some that are turned on in the seeds. Or so they pick that. Geneticists are well aware of that problem. Now, I'm not... I'm not I, I'm not familiar with the particular concern that you're bringing up. I do know that's part of the testing process. When, when, these, when they go through the substantial equivalence testing, they look to see what part of the plants this protein is being produced, and if there's any abnormalities, are there things being expressed in ways that they did not expect? That's done through the testing procedure. Now, as, as, as far as you're concerned about businesses and are they responsible for what they do? Well, of course, I mean, who's going to disagree with that except maybe a few business people, right? I mean, yes, that's what we want. That's exactly what we want. Um, the, the best route, unfortunately, for hitting a business to make sure that they follow ethical standards is either through law or through, or through lawsuits, okay? That they do something bad, that you hit them with, with a, you know, a massive fine or a massive lawsuit. I wish that people always behaved ethically and always cared, but that's not the case. I mean, that's just reality, right? And so there are ways to push back if they do something wrong. And I think that we're seeing the, that play out in the media and play out in the courtroom. Okay, so we have a question from the library. Um, could you elaborate on the methods used to force regular or organic mutants from classical breeding? Okay, I don't think I follow the question. What's, what's, say, say that again? Could you elaborate on the methods used to force regular or organic mutants for classical breeding? Okay, okay, so is it, it, it okay, if I'm trying to clarify the question, how, are they, how do they normally get mutations into, um, into plants with the conventional method, conventional plant hybrid genetics, is that, is that the question? Okay, uh, that's, okay that's, that's how I'm understanding it. Okay, so before, they would find a, a trait in a plant that they liked, okay, and they said, oh, look, this plant produces pink flowers, how nice, we would like it, we would like our plant to have pink flowers too. And then they would do a cross, a cross breeding of those two plants. And they'd say, hey, let's hopefully that some of the progeny that come out will have our pink flowers that we want. 
The problem is, is that you're no longer in control of this process. Any of the genes, let's say the good genes you liked in your plant, might get weeded out during the initial you know, production of seed. So you, you're losing control. When you, when you allow nature to cross two plants and you're not in control of it, you start losing the traits that you may have wanted to keep because you're no longer in control of that process. The genetic modification process says, I can pick this gene and put it into this plant. And it also has the benefit of crossing things that aren't plants. You know, we have genes that are from bacteria that were put into plants, and you couldn't do that through normal plant genetic processes. Yeah. Do I have to push the button or what? Okay. Hey, uh, um, I read one time that they found honey in the uh, pyramids and it was still edible. I mean, you could check it out. I don't know for sure. Okay. And you're talking about pollen and bees and stuff like that. I would think that if you want to genetically modify a crop, then put a flock of bees in there and see if it kills them or not. <laughs> it, the, you possible, know what I'm saying? Just make possible. it a bee test. Just possible. make it a bee test. Yeah. If, if, the, if the genetically in, in, you know, engineered crop cannot support bees, then we don't need it. No matter what good it does. Okay. That's possible. Like, I, a, canary. Yeah. like a canary. Man. Sure. <laughs> sure. Do we have more questions for our speaker? Oh, great. Uh, could you talk a little bit more about what the basis for substantial equivalence is? Like, how, how do you tell when it is no longer equivalent? Yeah. Um, okay. So this is, I didn't really get into a lot of detail with this substantial equivalence slide. Um, this was published in a journal, I believe, Trends in Biotechnology. And I think it's by Cell Press. So it's a pretty reputable uh, publication. The OECD... Uh, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development and the World Health Organization, they, come up, they came up with this idea of substantial equivalence, which is to take a regular plant that's not genetically modified, and then let's say you have a corn plant that has the BT toxin in it, okay? They say, are these two plants equivalent, okay? Yeah. So they'll do, and they'll look then at the genes that are in the plant, they'll look at the proteins that are in the plant, they look at nutrients to say, does it have the same amount of vitamin C? Does it have the same amount of vitamin A? Does it have the same amount of this toxin, because you know everything we eat also has trace amounts of toxins and stuff in it too. So they make sure, is, are the toxin levels the same? Are the nutrient levels the same? Well, there's one big glaring thing that's not the same, the BT toxin, right? They then take that through further testing. That's not substantially equivalent. That part's not equivalent. So then they take that and they do allergenic testing. They do uh, gene transfer. What's the likelihood of this gene spreading into the environment? Um, what kind of toxicity testing? You know, will this harm people? That's the gamut of tests they do after that. If the results from that data is inconclusive, they can then go back and look at the whole plant itself, okay? And they can do further testing on it at that point. The, the point is that this, this kind of outline here shows that the process of testing, the substantial equivalence testing, is not particularly simple. They do a lot of testing from human safety to potential environmental impact. Uh, to the quality of the food itself, and then if it meets all those, if you can check the boxes down, then it's released into the environment. Yeah. I was curious with the, um, the new information that we're learning about the epigenome and how uh, that's sort of a, a, an unfolding mystery that no one expected. Have there been any insights that they found through genetic modification that adds to that story? I, not that I know of. I mean, epigenetics is still kind of in its infancy. We're, we're finding that... So epigenetics, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, is the idea that um, you can pass on traits that are acquired. So this is kind of like non-Darwinian evolution. It's Lamarckian evolution, which is if the you know, giraffe stretches his neck a little further, does he pass on a stretched neck to his children? And the answer might be yes. Okay, And it's, it's, a, it's a thing called epigenetics, which is... You can traits that are traits that that arise from modification, not through the DNA sequence, so not through the A's and T's and C's and G's, but through methyl groups attached to the molecule to, to DNA, which can either turn on or turn off a gene. That might actually be able to be passed on for at least a couple of generations. What what does that have to do with genetic modification here? I, 
nothing that I know of. I mean, you know, of course, epigenetics is something that's now a new factor that we have to think about. Um, but it's not something that I don't think we've gained really any real insights from this particular process. So we have time for one or two more questions. Um, so is there concern with, um, with the possible correlation with all of this modification um, of increasing um, population control? Because with the mosquitoes and, you know, it putting vitamins in food and trying to, it sounds like it's, you know, all well and good, you know, we're saving people and things like that, but we're talking about, oh, we need to do this because there's this huge population problem, but we're solving it by creating ways to just increase population. Okay, so, so what, what's, what's, what's your concern then? Is that, I mean, with the list of pros and cons, I mean, it's not mentioned as a con that there are these other backlashes of, well, it's not being, cons you know, thought about. Do we have too many people on the planet? I, I think like she's actually, to put it in scientific terms, I think what she's yeah. saying is, aren't we just artificially, in, in it's artificially increasing the carrying capacity of, of the world instead of addressing, it's, it's kind of a similar question of shouldn't we be talking about population control rather than feeding a monster we've already created. I, I think that's what you're trying to ask. Well, yeah. I, I don't know how to answer that question without I, I don't know what the solution would be, right? Right? Because essentially, what we're saying is, well, if we're, we have too many people, so therefore we we need more food to feed more people. But what you're saying is, we're just perpetuating the problem. So what's the solution? Like, don't feed people. Like, I I I, I don't think that's feed them naturally, but not by means of right. Well, nature, I think our sure. I, I think everything that we do on this planet is artificial. Right? We, we wouldn't have the city of Seattle if you don't have electricity and water piped in and water treatment. Seattle is not a sustainable population at, what, 3 million now? It's not sustainable without modern technology. Um, food is just yet another modern technology. I, I, the idea that the planet's just going to kind of keep growing and growing and growing like a bacterial culture, like exponentially, is not likely. Um, the Economist. I love The Economist. If, if you uh, download, there is a podcast on world population, and they cap, they cap population at about 15 billion uh, in, I don't know, like 50 years or 100 years. And then at that point, they don't think the plant's going to grow at the pace that it has been growing. And part of the reason is that once a country becomes developed, they, people quit reproducing as much. You know, in Africa and in Southeast Asia, people have a lot of children. But once they become developed, they tend to quit doing that. They qu tend to kind of back off. And so I think it may be a self-correcting problem. You know, it's just I'm not comfortable with the idea that, well, you know, some people might go hungry. You know, like, it, it, it raises implications that I'm not comfortable with. Yeah. Okay, if there are no more questions. Oh, one more? Okay. Just for the gentleman who made the comment about the canary, <laughs> it seems like the comment you made about the um, butterflies not choosing to eat the pollen in the field. Maybe that's our canary. Well, I mean, it, it certainly could be, but that would also, I mean, you're using as evidence that maybe we shouldn't put it out there, and I would use it as evidence of, well, nature took care of itself. They, they saw a poison and the monarch chose not to eat it. Um, Am I missing any questions? So, we're not that smart. <laughs> Uh, if, if, everyone is okay, if everyone is okay with it in this room, we will find a few genes for intelligence and put it into everybody in the United States and the world, and I'll solve all of our problems. <laughs> <laughs> well, on that note. <laughs>